Okay, so before we start, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes discussing the So I looked at the poll results that I have sent out. Roughly 65 to 70% of the people said exam was just right. 20% of those said it was difficult and five said it was easy. I think that this exam was definitely more challenging than the first one, which is much easier. It's much easier than a typical 377 exam. This is what is more typical for this class. And what has uh, been a little bit of a concern is not all of you who actually come to class, but all of you the students who are missing from class and they seem to be not following the material as well as they should, of course. Asking you guys to do anything is not going to work. You are the ones who need to fix the problem. But uh, I just want to spend a couple of minutes asking for any comments you may have other than what we said in the poll. Anything, any reactions to the test? Did the in class thing work okay? I think it was not too bad in terms of timing pressure or anything like that. Much better than an evening exam where I have to deal with conflicts. But we are done for the semester with only a final. Any other comments about the test results? Okay, so we'll try to get that back to you soon. I think the Thanksgiving break is coming up next week. I want to return it before then. Uh, I think the grading has started a little while to juggle all the things that we have to do. Okay, but I'll get that back uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, I will. If any of you have any concerns about either the test or any aspect of your performance in the class, as I have always said, please come talk to me. I'm happy to sit down with you and personally go over where, what uh, you have in terms of grade so far and how you can address any issues because there's still quite a bit of the grade that's up for grab. There's lab three, uh, there's exam, the final exam. Uh, there's a homework that's going to come out today. There is going to be a very short term paper as the last homework. So there's not an insignificant part of the grade that you can still make up for any performance. So any questions about any aspect of your class performance, please come talk to me. Uh, we had uh, handed back exam one and indicated if you have questions about that, you can come talk to me. A couple of people who have come already, so I will call them that. Clear as well. Okay. Uh, the lab is out. We put in our extra credit part to lab three. That's another way you can make up a little bit of uh, uh, give a little bit of boost to your performance in the class. It's completely optional. If you are happy with the way things are going, you don't have to do it. If you just want to learn something new, you can certainly do it. And if you really want to make up for any aspect of your class performance, please try to spend the time to do that extra credit part for last week. Okay, and I'm going to give a term paper which will be weighted a little more than a typical homework. So that's another way you can work up. Okay. When is lab three due? Uh, lab three, okay. So there was some confusion about it. It was due on the last day of classes, which is December 5th, I believe. Okay, not, uh, 20, I think it said 28th, which was an error. So I had tried to fix that. So it is due on the last day of classes. That's good and bad. The bad is if you start the day before, you will have three other projects due and you may not get it done on time. So please start early. I'm giving you more time not to postpone it until the last minute, but to help you juggle various things better. Okay? Any other questions or comments? All right. So let's continue where we left off last time. So. Uh, if you remember, we were talking about uh, disks, disk scheduling, file systems, and whatnot. We have a little bit of material uh, that's over from last, um, last class, and then we'll talk about I/O devices more generally for the rest of today's lecture. Okay. So we have seen uh, magnetic disks. How do you schedule them? What are their characteristics? We said a little bit about solid-state disks, which are really taking over. Okay. So maybe in a few years. Uh, magnetic disk that we have seen that here will no longer will be obsolete, will no longer be worth studying. We have to look at how to design file systems on SSDs and so on. But thus far, there is still quite a bit of prevalence of uh, 
the picture the hard disk and SSDs are slowly become the more popular. Yeah. Smaller devices, phones, tablets, laptops, SSDs are becoming more norm than traditional hard disk. And servers is a different story altogether because they need more storage. SSDs are still expensive, which is really the reason they haven't taken off as much as they could have. And as prices fall, they will become more uh, prevalent, and then you have to rethink how do you design the standards for this sort of new technology. Okay. So, the, so both of those form what are called secondary storage. There's another tier of storage called tertiary storage. Okay, so primary storage is RAM or memory. Okay. Secondary storage is disk. Okay, tertiary storage is the third level of the hierarchy. Typically, these have backup devices where you store your data uh, for offline use in case there is a disaster, your machine crashes, something just dies, you need to be able to get back to your data. So any device that you use for archival purposes is called tertiary storage. Uh, example of tertiary storage are typically the tape drives, okay? which again are no longer used a whole lot. I mean, uh, maybe five, ten years ago, uh, you used to run backup programs that would take your data and store it on a tape drive. And then you take the tape drive and store it somewhere off-site so that your building burns down or something bad, really bad happens, your data is still not uh, lost. Okay? So that's basically how backup used to work. But the cost of disks have fallen so quickly that it's uh, just as inexpensive to store data on disks as it is to store on tapes. So essentially, uh, you, your tertiary storage is these days, the okay, most common way to do tertiary storage is to just use an offset server with disk where you basically make a backup. Okay. Uh, people use cloud-based storage uh, to do backups, other people have their own backup system, but all of them are now uh, they run on cheaper disks rather than the highest performing disks. You can just buy lots of cheap disks. A terabyte costs like hundred dollars, so you can just buy uh, some number of these disks, put it on a server, put the server offsite, and just make a copy there. Okay. So uh, uh, really, today's tertiary storage is still disk drive, but it's nevertheless good to understand that there are other devices like tape drive, there are optical disks like CD-ROM, DVD-ROM, used. In some cases, there are robotic jukeboxes that are used to do this. And so this used to be very expensive. And as I said, it's much cheaper to just buy a server and put some inexpensive disks and make that a backup server. Uh, these devices have slightly different characteristics. Okay? First is they are slower than your secondary storage. Secondary storage is, of course, slower than primary storage, which is memory. Okay? It is uh, typically cheaper than primary or secondary storage. Okay, so you can use tapes or you can use inexpensive hard disks, it's cheaper as well. Okay. Some of these devices have some characteristics that you may not see in hard disks. Okay. Tape drives are a good example. Tape drive is a linear access device, it's not random access. Okay. Just as if you have a spool of tape, if you really want to go through the middle of that tape, a block in the middle of the tape, you really have to do a linear scan all the way to the middle. So they are mostly designed for sequential reads or write. Random I.O. is much harder on these devices. Of course, if you use hard disks to do your backup, that's no longer a problem. Right? Similarly, if you use CD-ROM or DVD-ROM as your tertiary storage, those are write once devices. Once you write data to them, you cannot erase them. Okay, you are done. You have to use a new media to write any new data. Okay, so you will have certain characteristics for uh, backup or archival storage devices that you may not see in a typical uh, disk drive. Okay, so those are things you need to keep in mind when you run backups and so on. Okay, so that's all I'm really going to say about tertiary storage. And uh, you already mentioned tapes, which is basically cheaper, but linear access. So the real uh, takeaway for tapes is it is a linear access device, not random access. So, and that's okay because a backup program typically just takes all the data and just writes it out. Right? And when, uh, when you restore, you may either have to restore the whole disk or if you are restoring a specific file, you, you do have the time to go and seek to that file and retrieve its blocks. So it's not uh, required that it be random access. Okay, so what I'll do instead is talk a little bit about a different kind of storage device called disk arrays uh, that are used in servers. Okay, so tertiary storage is used uh, to do backups. Uh, RAID storage is used for high performance I.O. 
axis is so yeah, so there are examples uh, shown there but let me just define what this means okay so uh, a co very common type of a disk array is what is called RAID storage. RAID is an acronym that stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. Okay, so, uh, so there are two terms to understand. So it's an array, which means that your storage medium is more than one disk, it's multiple disks. Okay, it's an array of disks. That's what is shown in the picture here. So these are different kinds of arrays of disks. Okay, each of them is individual. This drive, they're all working together as a la larger logical storage device. Okay. Now the way you go about storing data on this disk, there are two ways to do it. You have multiple disks. You can treat each disk as an independent disk. So you can say, I create a file system on this disk. Let's say that's my C drive. I create another file system on this other disk. That's my D drive and so on and so forth. That's one way to do it. Okay. But disk arrays do things differently. Now. Okay. So what they do is, they use a technique called uh, data striping okay? that takes a file and it uh, stores different parts of the file on different disks. Okay? There's a simple picture I can draw to show how this would work. Okay, let's say you have an array of three disks okay? and you have a file which has blocks. Okay? So your blocks, these are blocks and blocks and blocks and so on. So the way you would actually store this file on a disk array is this technique called striping, which is going to place block 0 on disk 0, block 1 on disk 1, block 2 on disk 2, and you come back and sort of go round robin block 3 goes here, block 4, block 5, and so on. Okay, so you are basically partitioning the file into disk blocks, which the file system already does. And rather than storing all the blocks in a single disk, you are actually spreading the blocks across multiple disks. This technique is called data striping. Right? This is going to be fundamentally different from how file systems will store data on a single disk. Okay? Now we can ask the question, okay, what does this give us? Why do things this way? Why not store all the blocks of the file on the same disk? Why are we going to spread it across? Okay, so we can make a reference to the lines in the document as well. Okay. So one point being made is you can get parallelism. Okay, if you are trying to retrieve this file, okay, you can send multiple requests to independent disks. So you can say send requests for block 0 here, block 1, block 2 and all the disks will work in parallel. So the throughput of your storage system can be n times the throughput to retrieve any file, can be n times the throughput of a single disk. So you can get faster I.O. Okay, and that's one advantage you will get this parallelism. Yes. Good point. So, uh, are you saying it doesn't fail? No, it does fail, it does but it's less bad because it's just one disk down. Okay. So, okay. so point. The next point being made is one about failures, and that's really key, key part of uh, RAID arrays. And the point being made is one disk fails. Okay. Uh, the other disks can continue to function. Okay. That is indeed true, but then we have to do something more to make sure we are not actually going to see data. Okay. Uh, going off what he had said, we had talked earlier about how you uh, arrange things on an individual disk. Yeah. Um, this simplifies that, that you don't have to be very specific about where they're arranged on one disk. You can kind of put them anywhere across multiple disks, and it simplifies the hard way to say. Okay, so the point being made is if you spread data around, it can simplify some aspects. Okay, of how these two stories. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have two, uh, let's say some number of files. Some are more heavily accessed than other files. Okay? If you use the traditional method where you put files on a single disk, let's say you put some files here and the other files here. Okay? This may cause an imbalance in your system where the heavily accessed files create a heavier load on certain disks while other disks are idle. Okay? So you are not using the capacity or the throughput of other disks because you get load imbalances in your system. So if you use these, uh, this array as individual disks, you may get load imbalances where there's a very popular file that's accessed, let's say it's a web server and you have, have some popular web pages on that server which could be the index page and so on and there may be some other files that are buried deep in the website that are less popular. If you store them on different disks, some disks will get more heavily loaded and others are saying that I'm not doing a whole lot. But if you do striping, all the files are stored on all the disks because all the blocks of the file are striped. 
So if some files are popular, still you lose all of the disks, the capacity and the throughput of all of the disks to access your data. Yeah. So you can spread your load of your storage system across multiple devices and make good use of all of them without having to know which files are going to be popular and which ones are not. Okay. When you store and define, you don't know what its actual files are going to be. But when you stripe, it doesn't matter. Because no matter which file may become popular, you are going to use all of the disks to access data from that file. Okay. So it is better for load balancing. It is uh, uh, it's better because you can get parallel. Okay, we'll come back now to the point that is was mentioned about failures. So let's take two examples and try to understand what actually happens. Okay, so this next slide is the same three disks, but you treat them as individual disks. Okay, so here we are going to put file one, or let's call it file A, and then you put file B, and so on, and in this case, put file C. Okay, now if one <coughs> disk fails, let's say one of the disk dies, okay, all the files that are stored on that disk are gone. Okay, you have to go back for backup. If you have a backup, you're lucky you can recover, but if not, you lost data. Okay. But in this case, all the other disks continue to function. So none of that data is impacted by this failure. Okay, so if you may create it, let's say your C drive was here. B drive was here and whatever E drive was here, then basically you lost your C drive. Okay, all the data is gone, all the files that are stored there. Okay, so you will lose one end of your file. Okay, if your end disks, if you one disk fails, one end of the files are lost. Okay. Now, if you actually use this technique, which is striping, all the files, all the A, B, C, all the files are actually spread across all the disks. Okay, so now if you lose this disk, okay, same scenario, the first disk died, okay, what is going to happen? Yes. Um, every file that was reboxed in the world is going to be corrupted. Can you have something to add to that? Yeah. Okay, so now if you are using striping and one disk fails, one end of the blocks of each file is gone. Okay, each file loses a part of its data. So basically all files are impacted. Okay. So in the first case, where you treated the file this as independent devices, one end of the files are lost, the other files are intact. In this case, one end of the data of every file is disappeared. Okay. Because you basically have stored all of the blocks across all of the files. Okay. So if you don't do anything better, okay, striping is going to have worse failure properties because every file now has some missing data so basically all files become unusable. You can't really go and load a binary file if half of the data or one end of the data is missing. You can't execute it anymore. Okay, so all, essentially all files have become gone. Okay? So you need to, if you use this striping, you have two advantages. You get parallelism, you get load balancing, but you do have a disadvantage which says that if data loss is actually more severe in this case because every file gets impacted. All of your data is impacted in this case. Okay. So this is the reason you have what is called a redundant array. Everything I told you so far was a non-redundant array. This is an array that uses this striping and whatnot, but it's not redundant. It's not storing anything more that to protect from data loss. Okay. And you do want to protect from data loss because the data corruption here or loss is more severe. So what most of the arrays will do by default if you configure them in some reasonable way is they will have something extra that is for some form of redundancy. Okay? And this is why it is called a redundant array. Okay? So this technique which doesn't store any redundancy is called RAID 0 which is the first thing you store there. It is simply going to store one block, one copy of every block on the array. Yes? Um, in the silent 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3. So it's, so it's not you are asking what is this? Yeah, yeah what is this? Yeah. You rewrite it so it's more visible. Okay, so these are your disks. Let's say that's file A, file 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So you put A0, A1, A2, and you cycle back to A3, A4, A5. And so on. Okay. And then there's another file B, which 
have the same B0. So you will do B0, B1, B2, and you will Okay? So, uh, so as I said, if you don't store any extra information here, you have a non-redundant array, which is also referred to as range zero. Okay, range level zero is basically saying I don't store any redundancy. Okay, so now if you say I want to protect against data loss, I do not want to lose my data even at some distance, what could you do? What's the simplest thing you could do? The simplest thing you can do is make a copy. So if one copy is lost, you have another copy of the data. Okay. So the simplest form of redundancy is called mirroring, where you actually have an exact duplicate of every block somewhere else on some other disk. Okay, so a simple way to do this is this. So let's make an array of size four just to make it simple. Okay, so you have Four disks, right? Each disk will be a mirror for the other disk. Okay, so you have this disk being a mirror for this disk and this disk being a mirror for this. What does a mirror mean? Okay, so there is a primary disk and a secondary disk. The secondary disk will store a copy of everything that's on the primary. Whenever you write a block to the primary, you write the same block to the secondary. So it's a mirror image. One block. Right? So now you will basically store A0 here, A1, A2. But there's a copy also. Yeah, so there's a copy of A0, you have A1, A2, and A3, and so on. Okay, so now if you have the same disk going down, your data is not impacted because there's an exact copy of everything that was on that disk on some other disk somewhere in the system. Okay, so you can continue to function without any interruption whatsoever. The system will throw an alert saying one disk went down. Somebody would have to go to the Best Buy, buy another disk, and stick it in the system. And then it will simply recopy all of what was on the secondary disk back to the primary, and you are back to where you were at the end of that process. <coughs> okay? That's basically how the system would actually work. Okay? This is called rate level one. Okay? It's called the rate. That's all that shown there. Okay? So actually, so what it says C is basically a copy. Okay? That's basically each disk is mirroring some other disk in the system. Okay, so the good part about this mirroring is now your redundancy failure of a disk doesn't impact any data loss. The downside is now you double your cost of storage. If you want to build a file system with one terabyte of storage, you better buy two terabytes of disks because you need to make a copy of whatever is stored on your system. So you basically double your cost or put another way, if you buy some number of disks, the actual usable capacity of your system is half the total capacity. Okay. That here. So now uh, that's you can say that's too high and overhead. Okay, you're doubling my cost. I'm willing to pay a little more to get pro data protection or protect from data loss, but to two two x is too much. So what can you do? Okay, so that's where all these other techniques come in. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. This is all material from a graduate level course. I just turned this slide here to give you some idea, but I'm going to talk about one of these just to give you an idea of how you can do better. I talk about RAID 5 which is actually the most common uh, configuration of RAID disks. Okay? And so what RAID 5 does is even all of them have to store some form of redundancy, meaning some extra data. But rather than making copies, you use other techniques to, uh, to, uh, to have redundancy in your system. Okay, in particular, you have what are called error correcting codes which allow you to take some part of the data that's lost and reconstruct it on the fly. I'm going to show you an example of how to do that. Okay, so here is this. Okay, so I'm going to go back to our original example of three disks. Okay, so it will be 0, D1, D2. Okay, so let's say you store block A0 here and block A1 here. In RAID 1, you are going to actually make copies of this data and store exact copies somewhere else. Okay? In RAID 5, what you are going to do is you are actually going to compute a function of this, these two blocks and store that data here, which we will call a parity block. Okay? The way you compute a parity block is using what is called an XOR operation. If people remember XOR, 
So you simply take this data, you do an XOR and you store it. It doesn't matter how many blocks you have, you just take all of them and you do an XOR and you store it. So for n disks, you have one extra disk that is going to store your return and information. Okay? So if you have 10 disks, 9 disks will store data, 1 disk will store what is called parity information or extra return and information. Okay? So essentially, this is going to allow us to reconstruct data on any disk if it fails. These blocks, extra blocks. Okay, the, how do you do that? Good question. Um, would it just fail if both disks that you say the data came from? Because you wouldn't be able to extract the data from the block if you wanted to do other things. Why would you just like drop those disks and solve the new question? Yeah, so I'll come to that. Just give me a second. Because I, mean, I talked about what happened in the case of a failure. So first, let us, let's say this just goes down. Okay? And the application says read block A0. A0 is gone. There's no copy of it. It doesn't stop. Okay, you only store it. have A1 and you have this parity which is XOR of A0 and A1. So how do you get A0 back? Okay. The way you are going to get A0 back is through the property of an XOR operation. What you are simply going to do is do this. Okay, you will take read this block, you will read that block, you do an XOR and because of the property of an XOR operation you are going to get A0 back. That's how XOR works. Okay. The fundamental property of XOR is if A, XOR, B is C, okay. if these are just two binary variables and you go A, XOR, B is C, then what you also have is A is B, XOR, C or B is A, XOR, C. Meaning if you have the other two, you can get the other one back by XOR. Okay. You can just look at your XOR table. If both are 0, 0, A, XOR, B is 0. And then if you take B and C and you XOR them back, you put two XOR of zero and get back the same. Okay? So if one is zero, one is one, and you do an XOR, you'll see what I'm talking about if you do XOR and uh, figure this out. Okay? So this simple property of XOR operation that says you take two or more variables and you do an XOR over them and get a result. If any one of those variables is missing, you can take the result, plug it in there, and XOR all of them, you get back the missing. Okay? And that's a fundamental very basic by a property of an XOR operation that we're simply using to actually reconstruct data. It would say now this the block is gone, so I'm going to take this one and this one and XOR them, that's going to give me this one. Okay? So you can go back as a homework and take an XOR table and figure this out that this actually works. Okay, and you can take more than two variables and you see that it still works. Okay, now what does this give us? Okay, what is the advantage? Why did we do all of this extra work instead of storing a copy? Okay. Okay. So, the level of amount of redundancy you have is now 1 over n. n disks can be protected by this one extra disk rather than uh, if you have 10 disks, you need 5, ex five disks to store copies of what's on the other 5. If you have 10 disks, you store actual data of 9 and you only need one extra disk to fix. So you have dramatically reduced that amount of extra disks you need in the system to protect against data loss. Okay? So this is called RAID level 5 with just one uh, difference. So it actually this is RAID level 4 where you have a specific parity disk. If you spread the parity blocks around, which means next time you want to store A2, you put A2 here, you put A3 here and put the parity of A2 and A3 here. So the parity blocks are also distributed, which gives better load balancing property, you have RAID 5. Okay? So the only difference between RAID 4 and RAID 5, in both cases you compute parity. In RAID 4, all the parity blocks are stored on a dedicated disk. In RAID 5, you basically spread them out, and that gives better load balancing property. That's all that is here, as far as the difference is concerned. As you see, the RAID 4 has one parity disk, all the blocks are stored there. Rate five, you take the blocks and you basically just distribute, you spread them out. There's no dedicated parity disk. Each disk stores some data, blocks, and some parity. Okay. So rate five is basically what you will get if you just buy a rate card and just stick ten disks on it and configure it. That is typically the default configuration. Okay. So most servers that actually have lots of disks, they have disks and data stored on them. 
will have considered a RAID array and that RAID array will actually typically be RAID 5. Okay. It could be something more than RAID 5 uh, and you see that there's something called RAID 6 there. So main difference is how many simultaneous failures do you want to tolerate? Okay. RAID 5 can tolerate one disk failure. Okay. If one disk out of your three goes down, you can reconstruct. Okay. If two disks goes down, your data loss. You cannot fix that because you have lost too much information. You are reconstructed. Okay. So if you want to protect from two concurrent failures, you may need to do something more and then you get RAID 6 and RAID 10 and so on which I won't go into here, but this is the most basic example of having multiple disks and protecting from two disks. Okay? Any questions here? Sure. So I will yes, go to the next topic, which is IO systems. Okay. So we are done with file systems, disks, disk I.O. and all of those uh, good things and we use files and file systems as an introduction to how I.O. works. Okay, by this time you should have realized I.O. devices are slow. We looked at disk scheduling as a way to improve throughput. Okay, that's a common characteristic of all I.O. devices, not just disks. Okay, so now we are going to step back and say, okay, we understand how disks work, we understand how to use disks to store data, how can we generalize this to any I.O. device. All I.O. devices do more or less the same thing. They are basically going to do I.O. They are going to read or write data or both, depending on the type of an I.O. device. So we are going to ask uh, a question more broadly, which is how are, uh, how do I.O. devices work? How do you write a device driver or what are the basic principles? You can write a device driver, how can you schedule I.O. How can you read or write data from an I.O. device and so on. Okay, so that's what we are going to do for the rest of today's class. Okay. So I'm going to go back and uh, uh, to the picture I had put up earlier. So if you remember, our computer architecture picture had a CPU, it had a memory, it had a system bus, and it had some I.O. devices. Okay. And the CPU communicates with I.O. devices over through the I.O. bus. Okay, that's the picture to keep in mind. And now we are going to actually look at this I.O. device, which was essentially a box, in a little more detail to see what's in it. Okay, so typically what you have on an I.O. device is what is called a port, which allows the CPU to communicate with that I.O. device. Okay? A port is simply four registers that this I.O. device supports. Okay? So if there's a status register, that tells the CPU what does the I.O. device doing. Is it busy or idle? These are the two very simple status things that you can learn. Is it doing something or is it sitting there waiting for a request? Okay. A control register allows you to issue a command to the I.O. device, say read data, write data, or what, what's going on, some such thing. Okay. So the uh, status register, if you read the stat, what's in the status register, it tells you what the I.O. device is doing. If you write something into the command register, it's equivalent of issuing a, or the control register, the equivalent of issuing a command to the other device. And you have two other registers, a data in register and a data out register. Okay, so a data in register is where you actually write data that needs to go to the device. Okay, that's how you write. And the data out register is where you read data that's coming out of the device. Okay, that's where you read. Okay, so if you think of a disk, if you're writing to the disk, you write to a data in register and Whatever command you should, will, the results will be stored in the data or will be moved out. Okay. So this is the very uh, a very simple I/O device that has what is called a port. It's simply an abstraction that has four registers, okay. and these are the four registers. And the CPU will communicate with the device using these four registers. That's all you have. You're going to issue commands to your control registers. You can use the data in and data out to read or write data. And most devices will work this way. They may be more sophisticated, but the basic principle is the same. Okay. Now, most of the devices will also have a controller. Okay. The controller is the part of the I.O. device that is actually going to take commands from the, uh, from the CPU and translate them to into device action. And okay. I'm going to show you some examples uh, using a picture. So here you have a disk controller. 
that we will talk about this. You know, the graphics controller will choose on the graphics card that's going to display based on the monitor. You can have uh, other kinds of controllers. For, you can have SCSI controller for SCSI disks and so on. So basically, each I/O device will have an I/O controller. An I/O controller has a tiny microprocessor that acts as a, a small CPU for that device. It is the one that's going to perform all of the actions that the CPU has requested it to do through the port. You know, the controller is basically where you have uh, the microcontroller that's going to execute whatever it's been asked to do. Yes. Is the, um, is the controller different from the control register? Is the controller different from the control register? Yes, it is different from the con uh, control register. So the way you think about this, Say you have controller. The controller will have a port which has the registers. The controller is actually think of it as a tiny CPU. Okay, it's not really a full fledged CPU, it's a tiny CPU. So you are basically your actual CPU is going to simply issue a command which is going to write here. The controller is actually going to look at that command and actually execute it, which is let's say as a disk controller, if it says write. It's going to take data that's written to this other register and write it out as an example. Okay, so the controller is the part that actually executes the commands. The register is simply going to hold the command. The register is just going to hold some instruction that says do do this. So this controller is actually going to execute it. Okay, any other questions here? So this is the picture. So this is actually a picture of the PCI bus. Okay, so this is different from the system bus. So PCI bus is a bus that uh, to which you actually attach uh, peripherals or any of the I/O devices. And the PCI bus itself connects to the system bus, and then the, it, it may have other kinds of buses such as a USB bus and a SCSI bus. The USB bus is going to have all sorts of USB devices attached to it. There's a USB controller that's going to do exactly what I said. It talks to all the USB devices, for instance. Okay. So this is a very high-level picture of the hardware architecture of what actually is happening on the machine. Now we we'll look a little more detail of how the kernel actually works and how it talks to IoT devices. And so, okay, so this is a picture that shows you uh, how the kernel talks to devices. So the lowest level of your OS kernel are your device drivers. Okay? You need to have one device driver for each device in the system. A device driver is simply a module that is designed to interact with that device. Each device has certain hardware characteristics and the OS needs to use uh, a right software that basically interacts with the hardware. And that software is encapsulated in a device driver. Okay, so you have a mouse driver to interact with a mouse, a keyboard driver to interact with a keyboard, a, device, a SCSI driver to interact with a SCSI disk and so on. So for every device in your system, you're going to have a device driver. Okay? So device driver is the, where the code Decides to actually interact with the device. Okay, to issue commands to the device, to read data from the device, to write to the device, and so on. Okay. Everything about the device driver layer is device independent. This is the these are all this is not device dependent code. Okay. So if your, if your application says read or write to a file, okay, so that is a system call that comes to the OS. Okay, you have a file system that is device independent. It doesn't depend on whether you have a Seagate disk or a or an SSD disk, it simply knows about files and blocks. So it's going to figure out what block to read. Let's say you want to now read block 10. And then it is going to issue a request to the device driver saying, I need to read block 10 from this disk. Okay? And that device driver actually knows what model of disk it is and what exact command to issue to your control register in order to read or write that block. Okay? And those command sets may be different depending on vendors and models of disks and so on. So that part of the code is encapsulated in the device driver. Okay, the device independent code doesn't actually worry about the higher level abstraction. You don't worry about how to actually interact with the device. Okay, so this is how your kernel is going to be structured in terms of device independent components and device dependent components. Okay. So what I'm going to do in the rest of this class is show a little bit of what actually happens inside that device driver. We won't go into the detail of how to write a device driver, but look at principles of how device drivers are written. Okay, 
Okay, there are basically two or three different ways to interact with devices and the device drivers have to write code accordingly. Okay, so before I uh, go there, like there's some more hardware details of how you access devices and the way you do this is these ports that I was mentioning, each port is given a unique address on your system. Okay, just as memory locations are addresses, each port on each device actually has an address. So if the CPU wants to issue a request to a certain device, you look at its address and then you issue a command with that address and the system must will then deliver it to the right controller that answers to that address. Okay, this is how the CPU is going to actually interact with devices. So the way to think about this is devices have addresses okay, that go from uh, 0 to n, just as memory locations of addresses. And you can actually address devices using that unique port number or the address. Okay, so what is shown there is on a typical Intel machine, what are standard ports? Okay, so you have ports that are very defined. So the graphics controller, the graphics card on your machine answers to an address in this range. Okay, so if you want to write something to your screen, you're going to basically send out your request or the right request has to go to this address, okay, something in this range. If you want to read or write to this, your disks answer to this address. The disk that you plug into your machine will have an address in this range. If you have multiple disks, then each of them will have a unique address and you're going to use that address to interact with the disk. So that's what you mean in the kernel that you want to use. Okay. So this is basically standard port numbers on a typical Intel machine, just to give you a flavor of how you interact with the device. So clearly the device driver needs to know the address of the device. Okay, it's the one that's going to interact with the device. And what is simply being shown here is Standard peripherals are standard addresses that are typically uh, uh, given plane, and that's how they answer. And then, if you have some new peripheral, you will have to find the new unused address and assign an address to it. Okay, so now with that in mind, we will talk a little bit about uh, how to write device drivers. So the first way to do this is a very simple way to write device driver is called pooling. Okay? So you're communicating with your device, or your device driver is communicating with the device using this method called pooling. Pooling is simply a big while loop. Okay? And what happens if that while loop is actually shown here? So these are the steps that the device driver is going to take in order to interact with the device. Okay? First, it is going to sit and keep reading your uh, status register. So I'm going to write the names of the registers here. There's a status register, there's a control register, then you have the in, data in and data out registers. Okay. So the device driver is simply going to say, read the status register. Okay. And then you read the contents of the status register. Say, is the device busy or idle? Okay. So the status register, let's say, has a binary value. If it's zero, it says it's idle. If the status register returns one, it means the device is busy. Okay. So it's simply going to read the status and say, what well, is the device busy or If the device is busy, you cannot do anything. You have to wait for whatever it's doing to finish before you can issue the next command. So you sit there and you are going to pull. Okay. And once you know that it is idle, you can actually issue the next request. Yes, and let's say the next request is right. You know what right? To write one byte to a certain location. So what you will do is you will basically so now that this is idle, you are going to issue a write write command, which is simply a set of it's a binary value. Okay, let's say the write command is some binary value of zero x one one zero. So you just write that here. That's the command set for the device. And then whatever data you want to write, you are going to actually write that data out to the in register. That's one byte of data. Okay. So the register is one byte or one word in there. So you are writing or reading data one word at a time. Okay. So you are going to issue the write command here. You are going to then write the data uh, here. And then you are going to just, so then the status of the device is going to go from idle back to busy because it receives a new command. The device controller is going to go off and start executing this command. Is actually going to take whatever is in the register and try to write it. Okay. 
Okay. And then all your CPU is going to do is sit and wait. Okay. Periodically it's going to poll saying is it is the command done, is the command done, and so long as it's idle, you are going to or rather so long as it's busy, it's still waiting. And once you're done, you are going to go and look at the status register. In this case, the status register may say success or failure, or we tell you what happens. Did your command finish or not? Okay. And then once you read that, it may go back to the file. So we can issue the next request and so on. Okay. So this is basically a simple device driver that's simply going to take commands from uh, higher levels of the operating system and then simply write something to the control register and then uh, write something to the in or out of it. So if you're reading, you do the opposite. You say read and then say read something and then the results will be in the out register. When the command succeeds, you go to the out register and read the contents. Okay. So now with that in mind, you can ask what is good and what is bad about doing I.O. in this fashion. Okay. This is called polling based. If you are sitting in this query, you are registered to see what is going on and issuing commands for one byte at a time. If you have multiple devices, you could actually do independent I.O. So let's not even worry about multiple devices for that. I'm just asking, just take one device okay. and then you are do, doing I.O. in this fashion. So what, what do we know that you have studied so far that tells us what is good and what's not good and what's doing it in this way? So device is slow, you have to continuously poll. Okay. Typically, I/O devices are much slower than the CPU. You are going to sit and do busy wait, for instance. Okay. You are going to sit there and say, are you done, are you done, are you done, and you are wasting CPU cycle. So polling based requires you to do busy wait. The device that not good, wasting CPU cycle. Okay. What else? So you are reading or writing one byte at a time and you are doing this, all of this to simply read one byte. So if you think about a disk, I said a disk, you read and write one sector, okay, 512 bytes. So if you wanted to write 512 bytes to one block, you have to do this operation 512 times and each is going to be slow. Okay, so this, and it could be any other device where things are very slow, so this is going to be very slow in terms of how it works. You are reading or writing very small amounts of data. This may be okay for devices like the mouse or the keyboard. Okay, the keyboard, if you press a key, they are going to generate one byte of data which indicates what key was pressed. Okay? On a mouse, if you click a left button or right button, that's one byte of data. Okay? The mice is not generating lots of data at once. Okay? So for very simple devices, this works okay. So your keyboard driver is simply going to sit there and say, has any key, key been pressed? If the key is pressed, that value of whatever you pressed is going to show up in your uh, out register. That's a, you know, a keyboard is a, uh, not a write of device, it's a read only device. So you're going to basically read that key pressed from the, the uh, out register and process it. Okay, so for some devices, this makes perfect sense. For other devices like uh, disks that do bulk data, so this doesn't make sense. This is what I want to have. Okay. So it is slow and it may only be suitable for certain types of devices. Okay. So we should tell you that this is not the only way to read or write data. There are other ways to do it. Okay. So we are going to first eliminate this busy wait. <coughs> the way you do this is interrupt, which we have studied uh, early in this class. Okay, so if you do interrupt based device drivers, which is really the common scenario, polling base is really not to be used. You can write a device driver any way you want, but you waste resources on your machine if you really go and use polling. Okay? So the right strategy is to use interrupts. Okay? So nothing has changed from a hardware perspective. Okay? You still have your ports. Okay? The only thing that is going to change is your device is capable of raising an interrupt whenever it has finished some operation. You don't have to sit there and phone, saying, are you done? Okay. So you issue a command, 
and then the CPU or the OS goes off to do something else. It may execute some other processes and what when the uh, device is done, or the I.O. device is done, the I.O. controller will raise an interrupt saying I'm done. Whatever command was issued is finished. Okay? And what the interrupt will do is it will uh, pause the execution or suspend the execution of the process, will save its state in the PCB, and will go into the interrupt service routine into the kernel, which switch to kernel mode. The OS will go into the interrupt handler, the interrupt handler will go back to the device driver saying, okay, the command is finished. What happened? Go read the uh, in or out register, go read the status register. Is it a complete success? Do I have one? Okay. And then you take whatever happened and you process it. Okay. So this simple method is going to eliminate this event. So, so one of the two problems is going to go away if you write your device driver using interrupt handling. Rather than busy wait and code. Okay. The other problem we have not solved yet, which is you want to write more than one byte at a time, what do you do? So that we will look at in the next slide. So any questions on interrupts? And how to write device drivers using interrupts? Yeah, again, as I said, these are general principles. When you write a device driver, you use this method to implement your device driver. I haven't actually shown you how to do, to write a device driver. This mean interrupts to write to an so do you need interrupt to write to an IO device and read? In both cases, you are going to use an interrupt. Okay, so you basically you do write, uh, do a write, and you actually put the data in this register. Then you go off and do something. When the command finishes, the device will say, "I am done." You check the status, and now you know it's idle. It can receive the next request. Okay, so in that case, the interrupt is simply telling you that you can issue the next command for the device, and you can check whether the previous command executed successfully. Okay, in read, you know the results are also available. Okay, so <coughs> interrupts are going to help us solve one of the two problems, which is uh, basically uh, busy busy waiting is eliminated. Okay, so I will skip the event vectors and interrupts and talk about the third way to write device drivers is using this technique called DMA or direct memory access. I briefly mentioned it in the third lecture, and I said we'll come back to this when we talk about IO devices. And okay, now we have indeed come back to this, and we'll talk about this in some more detail. Okay. So, so we'll ask, what is the problem when you want to write more than one byte at a time? Okay. Say so doing this at one byte granularity is simply too slow. Okay. The CPU has to set an issue request for one byte at a time doesn't work. Okay. The OS is going to do nothing but do work saying go write this day one by write write this one by and so on. Think of a uh, uh, graphics controller that needs to update your screen. Okay? Meaning it has to write all of those pixels. So now if the CPU has to go and say oh update that pixel, go update this pixel, it's going to take a long time for your screen to refresh. So you are going to see the screen slowly change color. Okay, that's not what you want. So you want that to happen far more rapidly than a technique like this would allow you to do. So what you need is a way to write device drivers that allow you to read or write lots of data all at once without the CPU doing this at one byte granularity. Okay. And the way we are going to do this is a technique called direct memory access. Okay. So what the CPU will do is the following. Okay. So we still have our CPU here, we are going to use that and add a RAM here. Okay. So the CPU is not going to now do uh, I.O. at one byte granularity, it's going to do it in some larger granularity of blocks or pages. Okay. So let's say the CPU wants to write one sector, okay, or one disk block to your disk. What it will do is it will take all of the data, it will store it in RAM. Okay. So this is our one block. Then the CPU will issue a command to the controller saying, here is 512 bytes of data, go write it out. Okay, one, you can write it out one byte at a time, but write it out. So you are basically giving a batch command to the controller saying, ah, here is a chunk of data, 
go right. Okay? And you will give access to controller will actually have access to main memory. That's the part where why it's called direct memory access. In the previous cases, the IO device of the controller did not touch memory. Okay? Whatever data you wanted to write, the CPU actually wrote in the register and said, go write this out to your hardware or the actual hardware okay, or the device. Okay, now you are giving access to main memory to an IO device or an IO device controller to be more precise. So now the world that the CPU is going to go up and do its own thing, it's going to start doing other things. Your I.O. controller is now going to go to that address that was specified, take data one byte at a time or whatever the regularity, transfer it to this register, write it off. Take the next byte, transfer it to this register, write it off. Okay? So the I.O. controller is now going to do all of that work that the CPU was doing originally. Okay? So that is why I said it's a tiny CPU, it can do uh, something like what the actual CPU can do, but far less. So the ability to actually execute commands. Okay? So now your IO controller is accessing memory and writing it out. And all you're doing is the CPU, the IO device, and the main memory, they're all contending. Okay? The system bus is going to allow sometimes CPU will access data in main memory, sometimes the IO controller will access data in main memory. They're all going to start contending with the CPU on the system bus rather. So you'll have more contention, but so CPU has to do far less work. It doesn't have to issue 512 command to write 512 bytes. It's issuing one command and telling the IO controller you go do all the extra work. Okay. And if you wanted to read data from a disk, you would do the same thing. You would say go and read this block. You would issue a command and say go write it out to this buffer in memory, which would be a unused page. And your IO controller is going to actually read that sector from this and then essentially write bytes out to this location and at the end of the operation you'll raise an interrupt saying your sector has been read, it's now stored in that location on that buffer you are told me to write to and go read it from. And now OS just has to go to read, go to that location and get the data you can do to that. So all of this is called direct memory access or DMA. Okay, so here the term is basically just telling you that you are now given access to main memory to IO devices or the IO device controller simply to reduce the load <coughs> on the CPU. CPU doesn't have to now do this uh, IO operation that is regularity of one byte. You can read entire pages or chunks of memory. So, this is the most sophisticated way to write device driver. It uses interrupts and it uses direct memory access to read, so, uh, to read or write large distance. Okay, this is how you would talk to this for a graphics controller. Okay, so basically, you, you know, a graphics controller will write all of the pixels that you want to project on the screen into a buffer and tell the graphics controller, take this data and write it to the buffer. Okay, and it is going to display all of the pixels on the device. It doesn't have to write those pixels. Okay, any device that needs high performance IO is going to be DMA based. Okay, you don't need to do DMA for a, a keyboard or a mice. So all the mice is doing is left click, right click, that's all that is doing. And the user press the left click, you know, the right click, or it goes this to all the users. So those are very small amounts of data, you can still use interrupt based device. But for larger devices that need more throughput, you are going to do DMA based device. Okay? Any questions on this? So the Last few things I'm going to talk about are the types of devices. Okay, so uh, the device driver also depends on what type of a device it is and what kinds of accesses are permitted. <coughs> so here are some device characteristics that are more general. Okay, so the first thing is what is the transfer unit for the device? Is it a block or a character? Any device that you see okay, in your Unix world is going to be either labeled a character based device or a block based device. The character based device is you read or write one character at a time. The block based device is you read or write one block at a time. Okay. This is an example of a block based device. Okay. A keyboard is an example of a character based device. Keyboard does not read or uh, you don't read a block from the keyboard, you read one character saying what is the character you press, what's the keyboard. Okay. So any of any device you see is going to fall into one of these categories, whether it's a network card. Okay, whether well, it's a printer, whether it's a USB drive, this drive, they all do all of this. Okay, so let's take network card, your internet card or your Wi-Fi card. Okay, 
character base of blocks. It's a block based device because you don't actually read or write one byte of data on a network, you read or write packets, network packets, which are essentially blocks. It's a block based device. So, so that's your transfer unit. And then the other thing is, is it a sequential device or a random access device? Okay, so, some devices are sequential. Okay, so, and some devices are random access. This is an example of a random access device. Okay? What about graphics controller? Sequential or random access? Okay, first of all, a graphics card is an output device, not an input device. So, when we are writing things to a screen, no read from a screen unless it's a touch screen, which will be both of them. Sequential. So you should say, how is the graphics card updating the screen? Okay. If you refresh the entire screen every time, and every pixel is updated, then it's a sequential because you just start from the top, you just update the color of each pixel, and you go all the way to the bottom, and you update the screen. Okay. Now, what if you only wanted to update a part of the screen? Now, the, uh, only the middle part. Let's say you have a browser. Okay, only the borders in the browser is changing. The rest of it is not changing. And you need to only update a part of the screen without updating the rest. So you do that in a random access to So I'll be writing to only a region of the screen, not the whole screen. So it depends on the type of the card. If you're going to refresh the whole screen all the time, you can do sequential. If you want to access only a part of it, you can do that. Okay. So you have to think every time you have any device, some of them leave you all the questions to ask. Okay, so if I ask you, is a mouse a sequential or a random access device? Okay, so it doesn't even make sense to ask whether it's a random access, there is nothing to access. Okay, it simply provides for producing a stream of characters which is clicks that you're making. Okay, so in some sense, all you need to do is read the stream and it's coming out of the mouse. So you just read sequentially whatever is coming. You don't have to jump mouse clicks and say, I don't want the next event, but I'm going to take three events from now and see what happens in process like that. You don't do that. You just process mice, click the order and make them. Same with the keyboard. Okay. So some of these will just default to just do sequential access because the concept of random access for the devices don't even make any sense. Okay. But for every device, you have to ask this question when you write the device. Right? Okay. Uh, the other one is either synchronous or asynchronous. I okay. Does it support blocking or non-blocking? Again, that depends on the hardware of the device. Whether it's blocking or non-blocking, there are lots of other things. Right? Here is one: so input device, output device, or both. Okay, some devices are input only. Okay, some devices are output only. A printer is an output only device. A printer doesn't provide any input. Okay, keyboard, mice are input only devices. They don't take any output. Graphics card is an output only device. Okay, this can do both input and output. Yeah, so you will have to write a device that are accordingly. So then there are all these other things that are mentioned, the speed of the device, whether it's shared and so on. Okay. So these are general characteristics that you have to think about when you design the device driver. Okay. So and, uh, depending on whether, uh, and the main thing here we are going to talk about is whether it's character or block and how that is going to impact uh, the performance. Okay, so I already mentioned all of these examples of different types of devices. So I'm going to skip over through them. So I'll just mention one thing though. So if you want to figure out uh, how uh, our operating system treats a particular device driver, there are ways to figure that out. Okay, so in the Unix world, all devices, okay, so we go back here. So in the Unix world, all devices are treated as files. Okay, so you can actually look at the file system and look at the device. So if you go into a directory called slash dev, so in some cases it's slash devices, you actually see all of your devices with a specific file name. You can use that file name to interact with the device. 
So you will have slash dev slash mouse, for instance. You can have slash dev slash eth zero. So you can have that card, you have slash dev slash mouse. You can have slash dev slash USB, and then you can have a mice and things like that. Okay, so, so you can actually CD into that directory and just look at what's inside that directory. You will see all the devices that the OS currently recognizes. You can look at the characteristics of those devices just by looking at uh, what the file name shows you. Okay, so the Mac also does the same thing, but not at the same level of details. I'm just going to show very quickly. So I just went into slash dev. When you will see, I don't know if this is even visible. Maybe not, it will make all the other things. Uh, so you will see that uh, these are all things that you see in slash devices. So here is this zero, slash dev slash this zero. You see that this zero, this two, and so on. And if you look at this here, you will see either a C or a B. A C means it's a character device, B means it's a block device. The block devices you can read or write entire chunks of data at a time, and character devices you can only read one byte at a one byte at a time. So most of these devices probably won't make any sense except for the disk in this case, but you know, if you actually go and look at all of them, there will be lots of files. You will see if you go and look at slash dev slash mouse or every Linux device or Linux machine like that, you'll see it's a character device. If you look at any disk, you'll see it's a block device. And the way you can actually directly read or write is, and then you see a Bluetooth modem there. And then you see something called a Bluetooth modem, that's a Bluetooth card. You see as a character device, because you're reading or writing the input data one byte at a time. Okay, so, so this is one way by which uh, you can actually go and examine all the uh, devices on a typical machine and try to understand what type of a device it is. Okay, so now, assuming you have, uh, let's say, a block device, okay? uh, devices are still slow, so what is the operating system to do in addition to optimizing the device that was to speed access to the device? Okay? And the answer is you are going to actually do some form of caching and buffering to speed accesses to a device. <laughs> so while since all IO devices are slow, what the OS actually does is it has a memory buffer that, that you're going to store frequently accessed data from that device. Whenever you request something, you first look at the buffer. If the data that is being requested already in my buffer cache, if so, you're going to return data from the, the cache of the buffer, otherwise you're going to wait. And similarly, when you need to write, sometimes only write to a buffer, and then asynchronously write it out to the device, rather than waiting for the entire IO operation to complete. Okay, then the buffer is memory paid, you can read or write much faster to the buffer than you actually read or write to the disk. So IO buffering is going to use, be used for, and it's obviously going to be used when you use DMA as well. So it's used to handle all of these things. Okay, first is to cope with this transfer between the device and the CPU. The CPU is fast, the device is slow. The buffer is going to actually help the CPU do fast writes to a buffer or read from the buffer when the device is done, and then the buffer itself interacts on the bit. We have the IO device reading or writing from the buffer. Okay. It's used to deal with devices that have different transfer sizes from what is requested. Okay. So if you remember, I said for a disk, you use a sector to read or write data. Sector is 512 bytes. Okay. So you can ask what happens if the application says read one byte from the file. So you can certainly issue a command in your, your user application saying, Read the next byte from this one. In fact, you probably did that when you did your lab and you read the next word for your inverted index. And you didn't read an entire block, you read one word. It could be a few characters. So then, how does that request say, give me the next word if a few bytes, translate to a disk request? So the disk level, you can only read or write the entire blocks. So the way this is going to work is when you issue a request. Which is different from the granularity of IO for the IO device, you are actually going to read more data than was requested. So if you read one word, to read the next entire block and store it in the IO buffer. Okay. From the IO buffer, you only pull the data that was requested and give it to the application. So now the next time you say, do you read the next word? 
say that data was also in that block, but you already read the block. So you're going to go to the buffer cache, simply pull the next word from the cache and return it. You don't have to do another I at that point. So is that clear? Yes, so some, so basically the point is user processes may do I.O. in a different granularity than the device is capable of the law. So the buffer is used to sort of uh, bridge that gap. Yes, so you can do whatever you want at the user level, then you can and then you can also use uh, the buffer to reduce the time you block on the right. Often you write to the buffer cache and then let's say you chase it through the right it later to the door. You don't wait for a slow write to finish. You can just say I'm going to write to the buffer and then let the device pick it up from the buffer. So buffering is actually a key technique that you are going to use in the OS to deal with slow devices. And without a buffer, you would be directly exposed to very slow devices. The buffer will help us mask the slow device from actual IOs in many cases by reading or writing data, frequently access data into the buffer rather than directly to the device. Yeah, so this is IO buffering. There's one more uh, comment I want to make about IO buffering is uh, the two types of uh, IO buffers are also called caches. Right? So OS is going to use the term called a buffer cache, which uses both of those. Doing the same thing with this one. Okay. So here is two policies that you have in the cache that you may have heard of in some other context. Okay. So the point is when you write data to a buffer cache, what should happen to the return data? When does that get actually returned to the IO device? So you can have two policies. One is called a write through policy, and the other one is called a write back policy. And these two policies are not necessarily uh, just relevant. In the I.O. context, any time you have a cache, you have caches at the hardware level, you know, L1 cache, and then L2 cache, and then L3 cache on the CPU. The same concept applies there. Okay. Uh, whether you have a write back or a write to cache. Any time you have a cache of any sort, whether it's on hardware, whether it's in the OS, you have to ask the question, whenever you write data to a cache, when does that data get written to the actual medium? Whether it's the CPU, or the main memory, whether it's in this. Yeah, so this, these two concepts are a lot more general than this specific scenario, but I'm going to explain what they mean. Okay? So write through basically says that whenever you write data on the cache, you immediately send off a write request to the device. Okay? So your writes are actually flowing through the cache and hitting the data. That's why it's called write through. Write back, on the other hand, says when I write data to the cache, I just write it to the cache and it's written back at a later time. That's why they write the block to my disk. Okay. It actually goes into a memory buffer cache. And sometime later, it's going to get flushed to the disk. Okay. That could be 30 seconds from now, or one minute from now. It's going to be held in memory for some time. And in the background, you're going to write it out. It's called a write back cache. Okay. And depending on which policy you use, you are going to get fundamental trade offs. Yeah, again, it doesn't matter whether you are IO device or hardware uh, cache. Okay, write through policies have high reliability but slow performance. High reliability says anytime you do a write, it immediately goes to the device. Okay, so the device always sees all the writes immediately. Okay, so they have higher reliability, they know that there's no unwritten data in your system. Okay. But the performance is slow because it triggers lots of IOs. Write back policy has higher performance because you're simply writing to a memory cache which is fast and the background data is being flushed to the device. The application don't see this background flushing impacts its performance. You just write to the cache and you continue. And you assume that the data is actually going to be written to the device too. Okay. So <coughs> this is going to be faster, okay. but it is less reliable. Okay. This is why in many cases, if your machine experience is a power failure, your OS is going to start running a file system consistency check. So most operating systems make the design, design decision to go for performance or reliability. So you may always have some unwritten data in your memory buffers in the OS that haven't been flushed to disk. So it leaves your file system in an inconsistent state. It's just behind the power. Some unwritten data is blocked. 
Yes, so things may not be consistent. So then you do extra work after the fact saying I did not uh, write from data. Now there are inconsistent which I need to record. So you run the file system check, it goes and checks the consistency, it may delete some uh, bad data and sort of clear up some of the inconsistencies and then you are ready to go. So anytime you actually restart your machine to do a hard restart, not a great so shut down. You see that the host is doing extra work because it knows that there is inconsistency. Okay. To do a graceful shutdown and you look at the messages on the screen, you will say flushing buffer cache is the first thing that you will see. So if you have to issue a flat bound command to any Linux machine, you see all the messages flowing by it. They will say flushing buffer cache. This is what's happening because it's a right a back cache. There's unwritten data that needs to be written out before you shut down the machine. So I think that's an important takeaway is anytime you have a buffer cache, you have to choose between one of these two policies, right through or right back. Right through is more reliable, but it's also slower because it does more IO applications see slower performance. So most operating system trade-off speed for occasional unreliable or uh, inconsistent. Okay, that's a design trade-off. If you don't want that trade-off, you basically have to go back to right back uh, or right through. So with that, I'm going to conclude the lecture today. We'll continue for this uh, next time.